But what's more concerning is if you and that person have put together uh, financial powers of attorney together in in an attorney's office, and that person has (laughs) durable power of attorney over you. In other words, the person (laughs) who's incompetent is the one that has durable power of attorney over you. And, And that's the danger. Uh, we're laughing about this, but it's a it's an incredible solution. But we just want to head off at what could be a problem. And what Nina's talking about is often you go in together to see a lawyer. You each do a durable power of attorney, and you name the other. Because, you know, you were 45 years old at the time, or you were 70 years old at the time. But, you know, you thought, what what this is a great idea. If either of us has a stroke or something, mm-hmm. the other, just like that, takes over. Life's third act is a podcast dedicated to helping you get the most out of your retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, attorney CPA Joe Cordell features guests each week to discuss prominent topics for those over 55. Here's attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Welcome to another episode of Life's Third Act. With me today is Nina Windsor. You're familiar with Nina. She's an attorney at Tucker Allen. She's a managing attorney, in fact, and she's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to things related directly or indirectly to estate planning. The topic that we're going to cover this week is one that I'm sure some of you will find extremely interesting. In fact, you'll be on the edge of your seat. And then there'll be others of you that will say, hmm, not so interesting to me. It's the danger of choosing topics that that uh, are important, very important, but they're but they don't. Uh, they're not helpful to everybody. So I will say this. I'll think everybody has something to learn from this topic. That's certainly true. Wouldn't you say that, Nina? I would. And uh, I bet everybody knows someone that this would be good yes, information Yes, that for. could learn from this topic. So what we're talking about is the subject of divorce for people, especially who are later in their lives. They've been married typically for decades, plural, sometimes 30 years, sometimes 40 years. Uh, This is a phenomenon that, I don't have statistical proof for this, but I think this is a phenomenon that is occurring more. It's odd because some of you may not be aware that, did you know divorce rates have actually been declining? Now, I think part of that is because people now have the option to not marry. So some people that may have had fragile or shaky relationships, they don't marry, they live together. That's apparently a socially acceptable thing now. And I think those who do decide to get married, they're a little more thoughtful about it. I don't think it's cool to be divorced now like, you know, among the chic and the elite or whatnot in the the 60s and 70s there became this sort of fashion where, you know, everybody was getting divorced, it seemed like, and there was no stigma associated with it. I think there's a little bit of a stigma, especially when younger people who plan their careers so meticulously fail in this very important thing. This is just, this isn't just my opinion, but it is an opinion that I think I, I've, I've observed around me at least. Strong roots are essential for a healthy tree, especially your family tree. That's why you work hard to take care of your family every day. At Tucker Allen, we know that taking care of your family means planning for the future. Our team provides personalized estate planning to help you protect your family, your legacy, and your future. From wills and trusts to long-term care and estate planning. Count on Tucker Allen. Personalized estate planning made simple. Contrary to that, though, I think is is what I'm seeing happening in larger numbers for people as they age. They seem to feel, I don't know the explanation. Yeah, I mean, you you can give us your thoughts, but... But I, have we not seen, Nina, more people that are getting divorced after long marriages now than I think would have been true as a percentage 20 we, years ago? We are, and we're seeing people who may already have you know, estate plans in place, very long-term families, many children, um, and just hitting a point where there is a, a separation for whatever reason. Yeah. And by that point, though, they've already built their lives together. And so there's a lot of things that go into that divorce. Sometimes the divorces last for a long time. And if they have an existing you know, a state plan, we, we see a lot of uh, details that need to be looked at with yeah, that as well. Yeah, you get pulled in. Uh, this isn't just a matter in which Cordell and Cordell, which, uh, as I think all of you know, does divorce law exclusively, uh, but Tucker Allen sometimes gets pulled into cases involving divorce mm-hmm. just because, as you'll see in our discussion today and what will probably be two episodes, 
uh, you'll see in our discussion that it it's very relevant to the subject of estate planning, especially for people who are going through this transition in their 60s and beyond, even 50s and beyond. So it, it for those people especially, and don't you think that often when, when we see this happening, um, it's for strategic reasons? Sometimes, Meaning, sometimes it's it's monetary, uh, and other times it has to do with the way that things are structured with respect to children, or maybe it's because the children have left the home at that point. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, also we see those cases where there's health involved, so benefits are at stake, and how benefits are allocated, and how expenses for health care are allocated. Um, so sometimes there are reasons that people get divorced that that relate more to practical concerns maybe at that age than they do with simply being angry and frustrated and not fulfilled. I think there's some of that category too. Mm-hmm. And I think that partially is an effect of people living longer. I mean, we as people live longer, I think they become more reflective about the last years of their life. And and as the title of this show suggests, you know, the last you know, third or so of your life is important to you. It's the last third. And so how you spend it is something that I think people are becoming more reflective about. And and some some choose divorce. So we want to talk about some of the issues that they on this topic as they come up, just relating to estate planning. We won't get in this isn't the Cordell and Cordell show <laughs> on the subject of divorce. Uh, that would we could do a different show on that. But anyway, our concern today is how this is relevant for estate planning. So we'll start by talking about what are the circumstances in which people find themselves at the point that they're considering divorce. So if we if we look at this in terms of three phases, it'll be that period. So we'll talk about things on the front end that, that might characterize the situation of someone that's thinking about this. We'll talk about the process during the divorce. Nina has a lot of great observations to make during the process that, that you want to think about. And then we want to talk about some things that need to be done and considered for after the gavel goes down and after a divorce is complete. So uh, how would you characterize the position of most people before they launch into the divorce process among our clients? So some clients are looking at mostly at the financial aspects. And unfortunately, when you're thinking about a divorce, running out and changing your beneficiary designations and things like that isn't really going to going to stick. Um, it's usually not allowed during a divorce proceeding, which you know even better than me. Yeah. Um, and so as they're thinking about things that may be at what's at the forefront of their mind, but really the things that uh, over which you have control when you're thinking about possibly either separating or you are already separated and you're thinking about filing are things that have more to do with who you've given authorizations on things. Mm-hmm. And just understanding that the divorce process, both the... Uh, scouting ahead and and finding an attorney, that separation and Mm. and the initial filing, not to mention the pendency of that case, can take a a very long time. Sometimes it's quicker, but it can take years. So uh, the the estate planning situation, when someone uh, comes in to talk about this subject, let's assume they've not filed for divorce. Mm -hmm. Uh, They give you a heads up that they're considering it. What is their estate planning at that time? Do they typically have like a, maybe a revocable trust? What what are the documents they need to that are in effect at that time? Sure. Um, sometimes they will have absolutely nothing, but they think uh, sometimes incorrectly so that if they've got a spouse, well, it doesn't matter because my spouse is my default. So uh-huh. they could. This could be the first time that certain people are thinking about estate planning, um, oh. and so if they have nothing in place. They may not want to put a complete plan in place at that time, but there are certain things that they can do. If they have what you're talking about with a, an existing estate plan, and they may have a joint revocable trust That's with common, their right? spouse, it is. Um, there isn't a lot that we can change about that trust, even though if even if it says one of you may amend and the other may amend, you know, at any time mm-hmm. if it's drafted that way. Really, as soon as you file. And a judge 
looks at this and sees that you made an amendment to your trust, you know, things are going to be rolled back to the way they were. Mm -hmm. And really not a lot is allowed to be touched as far as the way that that trust is handled. But on the other documents, and and I want to get back to the trust also because that may not be as worrisome as some might think. On the other documents, which would be your financial power of attorney, your health care power of attorney, and and possibly the uh, HIPAA authorizations and living will that come with that, as well as the person that you've designated to be your personal representative. Because even if you have a joint trust, you probably have a will that appoints someone to handle your estate for things that don't go to that trust. Yeah, the pour-over will. And that pour-over will is yours alone. It, it isn't a joint will. So that appoints most likely your spouse as the next person in line. And it also, and this is very important, it says who you would like to be the guardians for your children. Now, if you're in the middle of a divorce and something happens to you and your ex-spouse at the time is alive, they're probably going to get custody of your children. But if you have significant concerns and they are playing into the reasons why you're getting that divorce, that will is an opportunity for you to give all of, uh, you know, a judge all of the concerns that you may have and nominate people that you think should have uh, the responsibility of caring for your children. Yeah. And I think that you need to keep in mind, especially what Nina was saying about anytime you're moving things around just before the filing of a divorce, uh, that's frowned upon by the court, especially retitling things. Yeah. So even though a revocable trust is revocable, so it's not a true transfer in the in the sense of the word that a court would be concerned in, still it is a change of title and it's something that only invites the court's distrust and suspicion, not to mention opposing counsel. So you get lots of questions about that. I, I Generally, what, what we suggest is that people not try to make those moves at a time just prior to filing of any sort. Now, as Nina points out, you definitely want to change your durable power of attorney, all those things. But but anything in which you attempt to change custody of your kids even, um, to, to move deeds around, I mean, those things are all treated with suspicion. So you need to talk to your domestic relations lawyer about that, and I'm sure they'll tell you that. So when people come in, I bet it is probably about half the time that they don't have any estate planning when they come into mm-hmm. us or, and when they come into Tucker Allen. So um, maybe we're not dealing with that. But even if they do have revocable trust, it can be easily changed. Um, what's interesting sometimes, though, is people may have in place an irrevocable trust. Yes. So talk a little bit about that. So irrevocable trusts are a little bit different because in certain states, and every state is different, for example, Missouri and Illinois are drastically different. So this is something to talk about with your attorney. But in certain states, uh, an irrevocable trust, in fact, in most states, an irrevocable trust does not uh, remove automatically with the pendency of a divorce or even the finalization of a divorce. So if you have named a spouse as a beneficiary or an income beneficiary on a tr- on a asset that's in an irrevocable trust, that's something that has to specifically be taken care of in your divorce decree. Mm-hmm. So when we talk about what are the things you put on the table when you come into an estate planning attorney's office, you know, all those things need to be there, but also when you go into your family att- family law attorney's office, office, you really need to bring in any documents that you currently have in place and any assets um, that you have in place and how they are titled. So not just, I've got this, but, oh, I've got this and it's in this irrevocable trust. Let me Mm -hmm. give you this document. Yeah. And and sometimes people will will come in with what's called a self-settled irrevocable trust which means that they created themselves. One of the parties to the marriage created this irrevocable trust. Could have been both that participate in creating it. And then there's those where it's a third party created, meaning maybe a parent, maybe a grandparent. They they have this dynasty, this family generational trust that's in place. Well, the good news is the assets that are put in there by a third party are probably going to be protected in the interest of whichever you know, parent or ancestor created that for one of the spouses. So the judge probably, if unless the lawyer malpracticed, this ju- this judge will not be able to touch this. 
So that's good news. That's one of the reasons people create irrevocable trust. We mm-hmm. talk a lot about that. That's a that's a reason that you're in a position when you do planning for your children and grandchildren, you have the ability to have a trust that's revocable during your lifetime. So during your lifetime, you know, if you got a divorce, you have a revocable trust, so it's going to be treated like probably like the other assets. But the good news is when you pass at that point What's left, what's in your revocable trust becomes an irrevocable trust that asset protects, that protects from divorce and creditors and all those things, your children, grandchildren. So we think that's one of the marvelous reasons to create a trust. But anyway, so and those people, though, that come in that have a what's called a self-settled trust, meaning they created it. Sometimes there are there's some deception going on. and, and maybe uh, one of the parties decided that they could transfer marital assets into this trust and make it irrevocable, uh, that, that usually invites a lot of trouble. And part of the reasons I mentioned a while ago that judges, you know, uh, look with, take a dim view on that sort of uh, skullduggery. But, but it happens all too often. And, and here's the thing is, even if you make a transfer, even if you make a transfer to an irrevocable trust, if it's a conveyance that's considered fraudulent, I mean fraudulent in the rights of a third party, it's not a valid transfer. Right. So there's this Fraudulent Conveyances Act that, that Missouri has adopted too. So um, those who have irrevocable trusts, if they're self-settled, they're going to be viewed with a lot of suspicion. It doesn't mean that, that some of those assets may not end up being separate, but uh, you're going to be subjected to a lot of cross-examination. So hopefully you had a good, not only a divorce lawyer, but a good estate planning lawyer when you when you created the trust, not just now, but when you created the trust to anticipate those transfers. It is possible to convert marital assets to separate assets by an agreement after the marriage. That's possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and it has to be handled, though, very carefully. All the I's dotted, the T's crossed. Everyone represented. Everyone represented. Full disclosure. The full disclosure thing is huge. Yes. Um, you've, you, there can't be anything the other party didn't know, uh, or it's probably going to be a, ba- a basis for undoing it. But anyway, if all those I's are dotted and T's are crossed, there may very well be this fortress, this irrevocable trust to which assets were transferred during the marriage uh, by one of the spouses, you will say, that may very well be protected. But again, that, that has to be done with two types of expert lawyers. You need a divorce lawyer involved in that and you need an estate planning lawyer involved in that. So uh, we don't see uh, that often. The uh, irrevocable do we trust. St- do we have people? Not, not very often and not for those particular in a purposes. Divorce. However, we do get requests that, you know, they migrate into a, hey, let's sit down and talk about what's the real issue here in a pendency of a divorce. But we'll have people call us and say, I need to come see you because I need to protect my assets and I'm thinking about getting a divorce. That's kind of the same thing as calling up and saying, my mother's going to a nursing home next week and I'd like to put her assets you know, in a trust and not worry about the five-year look-back period for Medicaid. So at the point that you are trying to build a wall around certain assets to protect them from divorce, you're probably already too late. But there are other things that you're not too late for. That's a and good so, point. And so it is a time to pivot and take a look at those relevant things, but you may have to kind of simmer down about the way that you want the court to look at what your actual holdings are for purposes of a divorce. That, uh, yeah, that bears repeating just briefly. You're probably too far down the road if you're thinking about doing an irrevocable trust around the time you're thinking about getting a divorce. As Nina said, I, I, that just sounds really tricky and and I think that that probably you need to move on from that consideration and think more about how you're going to handle assets in the divorce. I can tell you that sometimes when people choose divorce later in life, um, sometimes it's just purely for financial or strategic reasons like you mentioned qualifying for for benefits or or protecting assets from health care claims that they may see coming. But sometimes it's a it's a stew of things that include a, a marriage that has had a lot of problems, and then you throw in some of these additional challenges. Again, often as people age, especially in their seventies and eighties, often it's because of the health of one of the parties. Um, 
I had a case uh, when I was practicing as a divorce lawyer with Cordell and Cordell, in which we uh, we had someone who was an executive, very well paid, um, probably uh, you know mid mid career, fifty ish, and uh, this person had come in to talk about possibly a divorce, and uh, I, you know I think that there may have been another party I don't remember somebody he had met in other words uh, I am not sure about that it's a number of years ago so we had had that conversation no action had been taken he left me uh, after a, we talked for a couple of hours on a Saturday the next time I saw him was about three months later and he came in to tell me that he had been diagnosed uh, with ALS he uh, meanwhile he was not wanting to proceed with a divorce, but his wife was. And so apparently um, her motivation was, one, she was angry because she knew that he was going to file for divorce before. She knew that, and I guess she knew about another person. And and furthermore, uh, he was wanting to use marital assets for treatments that were very experimental. They wouldn't have been covered. They were going to be very expensive. Um, he was some involved, I, I know, going to Asia. And she was concerned that this person that she's angry at and who she believes, from her perspective, was going to dump her. Uh, I'm arguing this the way I suspect. In fact, she did argue it. Uh, and was going to dump her and then now is going to go through the marital estate and is not divorcing her, she would think, because she wanted, he wanted to have more money to use for his health care needs. So... She wasn't going to have any of that. So she was going for a divorce, and she immediately filed for a protective order mm -hmm. early in the case, a temporary order forbidding the use of assets for certain things. So here my client is, ALS. Remember, that's Lou Gehrig's disease, so it's not a pleasant thing to have. And, and yet he wasn't the sympathetic figure that you thought he would be certainly was in my mind, but in the in the mind of this judge who she uh, knowing her this judge as I did, she was she was probably going to be a little sympathetic with this with this wife, especially she had claims that there were some physical incidents and whatnot. I, I, I'm reluctant to use the word abuse, but they had been they had had some physical incidents, pushing, shoving, yelling. So my client was very controlling. He was a successful man. And he was very, very successful, made a lot of money. Um, so he did come across as this controlling figure. So oddly enough, um, the judge's sympathies, despite my most eloquent <laughs> arguments, the judge, is, the judge was more sympath sympathetic with her. And I guess, depending on how you look at my client, he didn't look very sympathetic. Uh, and he wasn't in the latter stages at all of his disease. So um, that's a case where divorce was chosen in part, in large part, because of the financial effects of somebody's illness. Uh, but I think that the, the parties might have stayed married if it hadn't come to a head. Uh, either my client could have brought it to a head with the girlfriend, if there, I think there was, but she may not have chosen to bring it to a head until she realized that that this person who was going to divorce her was now going to use up the marital assets. And so it was a very ugly divorce, I'll tell you. Um, very, it was litigated, you know, a significant portion of the marital estate was spent paying for lawyers. I mean, it was sad. It was sad. The woman was trying to start a business. She had no skills. She'd been a homemaker for 25 years in the marriage. So um, those are situations when you see, div see a, a divorce where it was driven by, for lack of a better word, estate planning or asset planning. Mm -hmm. um, but that we probably see it come up with older clients in those very practical terms more often maybe than younger. Do you think that's true? I, I mean, I think it's both, at least for people who have children, because there's mm -hmm. a, a panicking yeah. feeling. So the, the reason that people should go to an estate planning attorney is not always the reason or even most of the time the reason that they should go to an estate planning attorney. Um, they sh People should go because they're out of college and they've got their first bank account and they 
can't have anyone else making decisions for them without a piece of paper. Um, If something happens and they get in a car wreck or any of those things. But the reasons that people actually walk in are usually somebody else has passed away. Somebody else has had a messy divorce. Um, Somebody else has had a messy probate. Um, Or they have children and they're thinking, you know, we have some tension on one side of the Mm -hmm. family. I think we'd like to make sure that the guardians that are set up for our kids don't end up being any of these people that are family members we can't stand. You know, there's, there's all of these types of things, but it's usually this kind of a panicking, like, I'm missing something. Something is something could has go triggered wrong. Yeah. Yes. And so that triggering event um, could be some sort of uh, infidelity where someone feels exposed mm-hmm. financially. It could be something where there's a huge discrepancy in, in earning potential between the two spouses, either because one has got more... Um, opportunity or education, or maybe because one has stayed home for a significant portion of time and been more of a homemaker and taken care of children. And so people really want to know how things are going to go. And it's Mm -hmm. funny because they'll usually start with a hypothetical to one of their friends, like, hey, uh, you know, if somebody was going to have this and this happened, what what would happen in this circumstance? And Mm -hmm. sometimes in a consult, you'll get half of the way through and somebody will hit you with a hypothetical and Uh. you're like, oh, okay, (laughs) I just figured out why you're here. Um, And now I can tailor my advice to something that's that's really the reason why you're having that nagging, panicking feeling of what Mm -hmm. are you trying to protect? What are you trying to do? And um, and sometimes, though, don't you think that there are stepkids who are maybe pushing it along. Uh, it may have been a marriage that had been around for often a long time. Usually mm-hmm. these are not short marriages when this happens. Well, often the parties have been married at least 20 years, but it is a second marriage and there are stepkids. And as as they realize that the parents are aging, their health is declining, um, they're concerned about the other party's use of marital assets. Yes. So often it's one of those stepkids that is triggering the visit to, you know, to a lawyer, and it could be a divorce lawyer. Um, I know a case as I speak that that involves three kids. Um, there's one that was is fully associated with mom and and is telling, guiding mom. Mom's very subject she's in her 80s mom is very subject to the influence of this daughter and and there's a dispute over access to money between the two parents they're married these 80 year old parent 85 we'll say uh, couple and uh, the daughter wants access to money that the father will not approve and the mother the last report I had I'm not involved nor is Cordell Cordell involved in such a case but anyway um the last I heard is that the daughter persuaded the mother to file for divorce in order to get the assets seg- segregated because she knows that the mother will allow her access to these assets. So you have this couple that have been married all these years. I mean, it's at least 40 years. Yeah, this is a terrible story. <laughs> I know. I know. And uh, and I, I'm being deliberately vague. Uh because I always concern parties, you mm-hmm. know, I, I, I protect confidentiality. So um, it's sad, but but sometimes you see divorces coming along because the parties are aging and children or stepchildren get involved because it's kind of the end of the line for the assets. And and in fairness, if you have one parent who is has a little bit of dementia, but they can't prove it, and that parent may be spending assets – you know, I'm trying to create a, a sympathetic scenario. So let, let, let's give somebody a, a scenario where it, we can understand the temptation to try to protect assets. Because, you know, for someone to be declared incompetent, that doesn't mean that, that you can't remember who the president is. That is a very low standard. So, I mean, if you have a, a married couple and one of them is out spending assets freely... Mm-hmm. Uh, and that can happen when people are deemed competent, too. I mean, there's, there's again, this sense of panic. People just sometimes get these terrible spending habits, and they're acquiring things instead of giving them away yeah. at, towards the end of their life. And the kids, even if they're kids, I, I have a case where the, the kids from the marriage who are concerned are the kids from from that marriage. 
Um, mm. You know, but uh, people have gotten older. They may have some opinions about how the one spouse has treated the other throughout mm-hmm. that period of time and also about who has money and who doesn't. And so there are uh, significant concerns when people are going to remain married because of the fact that there is this spousal election if somebody pass- passes away over a certain percentage, meaning in plain terms, if you pass away and you're still married, even if you wrote somebody out of your will or your trust, most likely they're going to be able to sue for a percentage of those a, assets, a, depending on your state. We're talking mm-hmm. about the spouse. It's Correct. called spousal election. Correct. So, so you, you can't write your spouse completely out. You can write your, your kids out, and they don't have any rights after that. Yeah. But, but for a spouse, if you're still married on the day that you pass away, that person can still get... Uh, depending on the state, about half of your assets. Yeah. Even if a divorce is pending, if the gavel hasn't gone down, you're still married. We were talking about that. Yes. Yeah. There's, there's that kind of limbo period, and there are certain things that you can do, but that's not one of them. You cannot write your spouse out during that period of time. Yeah. Yeah. And so whenever, you, whenever though, you have an older couple, and, um, and let's assume that one of the parties is not making good decisions anymore. So th- this isn't the case where you just have somebody who's a spender, which you have that, as you point out, you can have that at any age where mm-hmm. people are, you know, a, a spouse is misusing assets or whatnot. Um, that you should have known your spouse, you know, you should know this person. But I'm talking about, I'm talking about a situation where somebody has changed over time because of aging and it's a mild form of dementia, we'll say. And yet it's a long way from having them declared incompetent. So as we were talking a second ago, incompetence is a pretty low bar, meaning in order for someone to, how do I say, I should have said that in reverse. Competence, it's a low bar to competence, meaning that for you to be declared incompetent, you have to be really bad, meaning that you've lost your ability to make decisions, et cetera. So you can very easily, a spouse, I'm playing devil's advocate here because I'm not advocating divorce, I, I, even though I'm, I have the relationship I do with Cordell and Cordell, I, we still don't advocate divorce. But I mean, I understand the predicament somebody is in when their spouse, who at one time had good judgment, now the judgment's not good, and they don't have any way of stopping them from incurring debts for which they both would normally be responsible mm-hmm. or th- going through marital assets because you you know you until the assets are fully divided they are marital assets and mostly yeah yeah mostly mostly so that's a situation though where i mean i understand i understand the feeling of somebody who who thinks what do i do what, what are your thoughts for that scenario? So thinking about, you know, do I file or do I not file or are there ways of getting around this as far as a division of assets? Yeah, I mean, what's a solution? There's very rarely if there isn't, what, you know, what we call consideration, if there isn't it, something in it for the person who is having some issues and spending or, or just, you know, not, not understanding things the way that they used to, um, there is an opportunity for divorce if that person is still competent because they can actually sign off on something. Uh, but, but divorcing somebody is a very drastic measure, particularly if the reasons don't have to do with your level of affection for them. Yeah. And and, and something I failed to mention, too, and that you would feel comfortable with uh, is a legal separation. Yes. Yeah, you can get a legal separation in the state of Missouri. That that does. You read my you. mind. So okay, okay, sorry. Yes, so I didn't get it out of you. no, that's um, that is that is an option. And at that point, you know, if you can get the assets separated, you can go ahead with either new or revised estate planning documents that reflect that in an effort to pass things down uh, to your children directly or or to a charity for that matter. Um, whatever your intent might actually be. Um, but it is a way of protecting yourself. And a lot of the things that we talk about here are just ways of being able to sleep at night and not worry about the unknown. And so this is really going through something in a very nitty gritty way, which most family law actions do cover, um, mm-hmm. of really just putting everything out on the table and figuring out what is the next 
step forward, not what is my best option, because if you're in that situation, clearly things have not gone as planned. But there are ways of mitigating the way that you feel. So if somebody walks into a good family law attorney's office or a good estate planning attorney's office, um, they are going to feel better walking out. They may get news that they didn't want to get as far as what they're allowed to do, like don't change your beneficiaries on your life insurance policies Mm -hmm. when you're thinking about getting divorced. Um, So you may get, you know, a little slap on the wrist or a, hey, you know, pause and don't do this. But you're also going to get information that says, here are your options. And these are the ones that are going to potentially work for you. Yeah, and and um, sometimes it is possible if you if the problem in your marriage does relate to somebody who's had who's changed over time, and you're trying to figure out how do you deal with the risk and problems associated with that. Um, some of you would be able to consider some sort of uh, conservatorship, guardianship. Uh, that's a little intrusive. It's it's better if you have a spouse that's cooperative and and not combative and 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 most this is the way it happens most of the time is this spouse that I'm describing the one who may deteriorate a little faster than the other is often submissive to the to the better state to the to the greater condition of the other party that's kind of what I witness around me normally it happens and and it works it works that's one of the beauties of of marriage is you you know the uh, gradually you may have one party who appears to be making most of the decisions then you look at them 30 years later and there's reverse roles and that works you know that's a that's a partnership but when when it doesn't happen that way when the other person may be more combative then you know you have a shorter list of alternatives you know one is you live with it you you protect what assets you can. You place them in your name alone. This is outside of any divorce proceeding or any family court proceeding. But you can you know you can have assets to where they're in your name alone at least. So that gives you some protection. It may still be a marital asset, incidentally, but that's not relevant unless you're going to family court. So so there are things you can do you know outside of seeking any sort of of legal solution. But another thing you can do though is is if they're if you don't want to do a conservatorship, you don't want to do a guardianship, that's unfriendly, it's messy, it's expensive, uh, it involves conflict, almost assuredly it involves conflict unless this person is totally acquiescent. And if they're totally acquiescent, you should be doing a durable power of attorney, right? Mm-hmm. Explain to them a little bit about the durable, that option. So the durable power of attorney, you may already have one in place where you are able to make financial decisions for your spouse. Um, And that's something that would not be springing, which is the other option where it'll say in that effectiveness uh, section of the power of attorney, it'll say, when does this become effective? It could only be effective upon the incapacity. And so even if you think they've lost their marbles and they aren't in a good state, unless they're actually declared that way by a couple of doctors, normally you're not going to have power over that person. Yeah, but but not by a judge. Let me, I'm just jumping no, in. No, not by a clear. judge. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. You don't deal with courts and lawyers, but go ahead. No, but you may need to see their primary care physician and probably usually a specialist who deals with maybe memory care or something like that and they they write a letter and say this person does not have the capacity to you know make their own financial decisions and then you've avoided that whole conservatorship guardianship thing mm-hmm. um now if they still have capacity and you have durable power of attorney for them the good thing is you can at least see all the accounts and things like that and kind of see what's going on behind the scenes of your finances but what's more concerning is if you and that person have put together uh, financial powers of attorney together in a, in an attorney's office and that person has durable <laughs> power of attorney over you. In other words, the person <laughs> who's incompetent is the one that has durable power of attorney over you. And and that's the danger. Uh, we're laughing about this, but it's a it's an incredible solution. But we just want to head off at what could be a problem. And what Nina's talking about is often you go in together to see a lawyer, you each do a durable power of attorney, and you name the other. Because, you know, you're 45 years old at the time, or you were 70 years old at the time. But, you know, you thought, what what this is a great idea. If either of us has a stroke or something, mm-hmm. the other just like that takes over. But, you know, this is a decade or more down the road and suddenly it's clear that one party is not as capable. 
So you're right. You need to you need to think about you can revoke a durable power of attorney, and there are steps. So one of the, among those steps are notifying anybody that you know has a copy. Yeah, it, it's not really the greatest plan in the sense of. It's not something that you filed with the court initially. You know, most right. states don't require you to do that or don't even allow you to do that. And so you have to think about, okay, this document is out there. It was effective the day I signed it to let my spouse make decisions. Now they're kind of off or I'm thinking about divorcing them. And I really don't want them to have this document and go to anywhere where I've got a, a financial account and pr- basically pretend to be me, you know, be there in mm-hmm. my stead. Right. And Act so issue. you have to basically revoke that document manually from each of the places that you think it may be presented and notify people that you've revoked this document and it is not going to be effective and that they should not give it any credence if it and, walks and in that's the door. And pretty, that's pretty practical. Um, it is. So we want to give you a practical plan. And so what, what Nina's describing, I mean, you can do that. You can, you know, hopefully it's no more than three, four, five financial institutions that you've dealt with. So you'd have to notify them that you had revoked it. Uh, you're supposed to notify your husband, if it's your husband we're talking about. For the sake of this discussion, we'll say it's the husband that, that is has declined. So you do need to notify him. You know, you can choose how carefully, how... Uh, you can send a letter to yourself, which shows up yeah. in the mailbox. I mean, I, you know, you can handle that adroitly, is all I'm saying. <laughs> yes. Uh, and then you want to be sure you have your husband's, one that your husband has signed for you. And as Nina said, um, you know, there's still things he can go out and do because he's not been declared incompetent. But but you can look over his shoulder and see what he's doing. Plus, you can volunteer to go sign anything that would otherwise need to be signed. Mm-hmm. And let me go back again and state that for 90 percent, at least, of the couples, this is such a marvelous tool, a durable power of attorney, because it's not unfriendly, meaning you don't have this conflict between the the husband and wife. You have have one who has a need, whether it can be a trauma, a car accident, a a stroke. I'm out of town for business. You know, it, it could be something as simple as that. As long as you're not trying to transfer property that's a marital asset or something like that, it's a very, very useful, convenient tool. And so when people are asking what are the you know, downsides and upsides, I'll always tell them, okay, well, if something happens with your relationship, you know, call me immediately because this is what you've got in place. Mm. But generally, if things go well, it is a very convenient tool. Yeah, yeah. And it's a cheap tool. It doesn't cost mm-hmm. you much to have your state planning lawyer prepare that for you. So um, that that's one of the go-to things, though, that I think people can consider. But the other thing that I want to mention before we conclude this segment is something that we talked about a few moments ago. A legal separation is if none of these things that we've talked about here most recently, none of these things will work, meaning the durable power of attorney, uh, the the voluntary cooperation, um, and you're not at the level of qualifying or perhaps nor are you at the level of wanting to go through the process of a guardianship and a conservatorship. And for those people, we would say first that you don't have to choose divorce. There is an alternative, and that's what Nina was explaining a while ago, which is a legal separation. You can get a legal separation that fully protects your assets. It divides the assets between you as a, as a divorce would, but it's not a divorce. So it's for those of us who, uh, for religious reasons, see a big difference between a legal separation and a divorce, uh, you know, I emphasize that this is not a divorce. But it would place in their hands, in the control perhaps of a guardian, probably. You may qualify on a guardian under those circumstances that you may not otherwise. But either way, you protect, you divide up the assets, yours are protected, and there's a good chance that the court's going to order some sort of protection for the other half of the assets, whether or not they do. The point is you've you've done the best you could perhaps in a desperate situation. What would what else would you add concluding? Just taking a look at what areas of your life at that time that your spouse either has control over, is a co-signer on, and, you know, we can talk about this at another time, but health care as well. So yeah. just thinking about just kind of reframing your view that this person is your backup yeah. for things. So it may not be extremely contentious, 
but they may have taken themselves kind of out of the running as someone that you can depend on for these things. Yeah. And so there are discussions to be had at that point about how to uh, how to find somebody to rely on and how to get that in place. Yeah, yeah. And, and these are critical components. So where we'll pick up uh, in the next show, the final half of this discussion, is we'll pick up with um, some things that are going on during the divorce, uh, but especially we'll talk about strategies in the aftermath. Um, so we'll cover a little bit of ground we've covered already by necessity uh, in order to pick up where we were. But anyway, I uh, hope you find this. Uh, some of you I know, as I said at the beginning, some of you are all in on this discussion, and some of you might find it less relevant. But in either case, we hope that all of you find it interesting. Till next time, this has been another episode of Life's Third Act. Take care. You've been listening to Life's Third Act a podcast for thriving in retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, your estate and elder law advisors. Each week we discuss topics and answer questions to help you better plan for your future. For more information, visit TuckerAllen.com. Subscribe and listen again next week for another edition of Life's Third Act. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements. 